Yeah, so gender dysmorphia in like India. That's her. All right. Anyway, it, all great thoughts. Let's bring this back to center a little bit. Um, One comment on that. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So my friend Scott, I talked to him last night for a while out in Portland. He's uh, it's like mid 50s. And he asked me, he said, have you ever seen uh, Bob Odenkirk's first show? I said, Mr. Show with David Cross. And he said, yeah. I said, yeah. He goes, it's one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. Oh, Bob Odenkirk is a genius. And in the first or second episode of that, they're they're talking about how, uh, and this is in like 94, 90s, so the 90s. And... um, David Cross is like, well, the, the, the pansexual uh, population, you see, we're going to, they're two customers. They're going, so we're going to get them both ways. And it's all about, so, and the fact that that was in, and anyway, my friend Scott was like, it was so prescient of them to like write something like that. And, and uh, so that was it. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, David Cross, he so he's funny, but then you like talk, you like hear him in real life without him being funny, and that guy's like really bitter, like about a whole lot of things. I think he's bitter about his career, but it's whatever, it's fine. I would be too if like Arrested Development was like the height of my <laughs> of my thing. And then, hey, he was on tour for comedy for a long time, a lot for a long time, long time tour. Well, that tour can get you. Like you go out on the road, and and that's it. So we've covered a lot of ground here. I mean, we talked about, you know, your past a little bit. We talked about your dad. We talked about, um, we talked about, you know, your morning oblations um, <laughs> and all that. We also talked about some stuff that we've had to cut from the podcast. We're not going to revisit that, but we did talk about some of those things. Um, if you want to hear more about that, you can pick up part one of this podcast. So in part two, which is what we're starting on right now, um, we're going to want to fast forward a little bit to like current things, right? So you and I met in 2002. Yeah, 2002. Um, at uh, It was Burlington County College. Now it is Rowan Community College. Oh, look at that. I just saw a breaking news thing flash across my phone. Elon Musk buys Twitter for $44 billion. Drop in the, <sighs> drop in the bucket. Drop in the bucket. He just found some change in his... His couch cushions. <laughs> he he didn't realize he hasn't checked his PayPal account in quite some time. It's been a while. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. That's tweetable. Hey, that's a tweet. <laughs> oh. God, I'm gonna go on record here. I think a that couldn't have happened to a better group of people, and b, um, I hope, and I know this won't happen, but like I hope he just yanks the plug out of the wall on that thing. <laughs> I'm going to go public and say that. I thought so. Yes, just delete Twitter, <laughs> buy it and delete it. <laughs> what do we need that for? Yeah, I mean, that would be that, that would be amazing. It would be he would achieve Tony Stark Iron Man 1 status. I mean, it's 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 a statement. Congratulations. All of you all should be thanking me. I've successfully privatized social media. <laughs> and then just put on his sunglasses and then just walk out of the congressional committee while Gary Shandling is just yelling at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it would be awesome if he had an Iron Man suit. It would like be. That was his, some some his... people have gotten up after him about that on Twitter. They have. They're like, dude, why don't you just build an Iron Man suit? And he's like, I, I, I don't have time. It's, it's beneath me. <laughs> it's beneath me. <laughs> I just bought I just bought this platform. Shut up. <laughs> anyway, okay, cool. Well, that now makes this current. Um so yeah, fast forward to what you're doing now. So we met in 2002. You were um you were starting starting we were starting a literary magazine, um which was a loose leaf sheet of paper that said sign up. I distinctly remember coming along because this is the time this is who I was at the time going are there groupies for literary magazines? And you confidently <laughs> assured me that there are groupies for everything. And I was like, I'm sold. <laughs> I'm in. Cause that's where my brain was at at the time. Um, this is before marriage and children and maturity and well, semi maturity and everything else. Um, and then, yes, I remember, I remember your ODing and you didn't want to see me at the hospital. You were like, don't come. 
don't come see me. Um, and that was fine. I mean, I kind of, I kind of got the sense that like that was not a state that you wanted me to see you in. Um, but I did talk to your mom during that time and kept up with her. Um, and your mom met my mom. That was really interesting. Um, mom meets mom going through the rye. And then, um, cause they're both two different, they're two radically different women. Um, and then I went to Bemidji State University, a, a university that I picked. I mean, this wasn't the whole reason, but you looked at you looked at the brochure for the university and you looked at the, the, the lake and the trees and you went, dude, that place looks peaceful. <laughs> By the way, all that uh, the the situation you just described or the interaction between our mothers and that like if I knew that it was, you know, 18 years, 17 years ago, shortly after. And this is the first, you know six the first several years that after the od and the coma you know i i there for all i know i was just hearing everything you just said for the first time oh well then i'm gonna so, i'm gonna update you on your own history so thank you i appreciate you're, you're that. Welcome. <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> uh so yeah so i went to Bemidji state university um my alma mater and, uh, and then, like, we kind of fell out of circulation. I wound up working at University of Minnesota, did a whole bunch of different things there, had a whole a numerous plethora of experiences. Um, you had your plethora of experiences, which we will talk about here in just a minute. And, um, and then I re-ran into you in, like, 2017, 2018. Um, you know, married kids oh, your 40th birthday on my 40th birthday right when you brought a walking stick to my house and then yeah. proceeded to be you know, on my own lawn at croquet which had been my game in college which is an unbelievable uh short-sighted piece of thing for me and i will correct that very quickly <laughs> you had other people friends work friends that were there that you were entertaining and had to you know like i know how to you, you know building work relationships is a completely different do you just do you walk into the room and and just dominate you know you gotta you know so i thought you were giving uh everybody a pass to be honest with you, you thought i was giving everybody a pass i know okay, i think well, yeah i think you were you were I you were you're probably, I probably you're, was. <laughs> You were you were in it for strengthening the interpersonal and uh, you know, business relationships. That's true. I wasn't trying to go to the hole and dominate, <laughs> even if it was the croquet wicket. <laughs> so, so thank you. Uh, well, you know, croquet had been my game in college. I mean, that was my game. We actually wound up, we wound up playing. You know, we we tried to play an Ivy League team. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't play us. But apparently, they, they, that's what they do in the Ivy League. They actually have, like, croquet tournaments and stuff. It's, like, it's a huge thing. Um, I would have know. liked to see you say, uh, will you allow us, allow us, allow us. To, <laughs> to play you if I, Hassan Terrells, take on your entire debate team <laughs> and win? Actually, actually I would have, my, my pro team, my team to take on like Harvard would have been a guy with wind black wind pants who was a chain smoker from Tennessee. Um, a guy named Matt, I won't give his last name. He was, so he works in higher education. I don't want to ruin his career, but a guy named Matt who was about five foot eight and about 120 pounds, but could whip that mallet. <laughs> and then my other buddy, Chad Mo, he knows who he is. I would take him. And then um, a wascally Canadian who played hockey I would take him. We molded him into something. <laughs> That'd be my team, and we would we would dominate. We would just dominate. I mean, anyone with the confidence to chain smoke and wear wind pants and be un completely unfazed by yeah, that's good sense uh -huh. or anything. Yeah, yeah. Just like this is like I just imagine like that dude at like nine years, seven years old was in wind pants and chain smoking, his and was nickname, his nickname was Lumpy. In college because that's basically i mean he never left his he never left his his room he smoked out the window because that was like i was on the cusp of the year in minnesota where you could still smoke indoors but they were like shifting it over and all the people in the hinterlands of minnesota were like <laughs> and they were all yelling 
and it didn't matter. Like the people down in Minneapolis had made the decision, so <laughs> you're done. Uh, you're done, son. It's over. <laughs> you just didn't procreate enough. Like I'm sorry, there's not enough voters here. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> you were too busy hiding in the woods behind a tree, I'm talking about Finnish pride. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, ain't that the beautiful and brutal truth? Um. Anyway, so yeah, no, he was from Tennessee. And he was, and he was a seventh day. Well, he is a seventh day Adventist. So, I don't know how that all aligns with the chain smoking and the wind pants. But it, I mean, he was, oh, and he was, he was, he was good with that cocaine mallet. He was good, and he could intimidate. He could talk trash like nobody had ever seen before, just at a level that was unbelievable. Like he could talk trash to Dennis Rodman and be okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it's you know, there's something about what you said a few minutes ago, uh, the sign up. Oh and yeah, I've mm-hmm. I've recently come to well, you mentioned the groupy thing, yes, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, I'm coming back to this place. It's interesting. You said uh, the other day about vocabulary and writing. You're like, mm-hmm. if I know it, I'm just going to do it. It's not my not my problem, and yeah. it's yours. And so when uh, recently I have kind of come full circle, uh, that was kind of like. I don't know, in a way, a harmless manipulation to say there's groupies, which is true. It's a true statement because there are groupies for everything. However, I was like, uh, this is the only dude who's come by and he has attacked this from like the CEO my like uh where do you see the club and you know to how do you yeah. how, how do you feel the club will integrate into to the campus it's a how, campus community <laughs> how this how will this how will this uh better how will this you know what affects blah, blah, and just going on and on and on i was like oh man i better and so i i thought i needed to like when the groupie thing i was like yeah 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 so i just had to like i was just grabbing at anything just that would anything. get another member because uh i don't know my uh my uh it's codependent nature, <laughs> <laughs> and so, but well, th- but that like passive manipulation thing, uh, oh, wow. in a way, I'm. I saw everything in regard. It was like a really black and white thing, like sobriety early on, and then to the meat of it. And now there was a a, a point of it where it was like, I. Like I just saw as everything that I used to do and think was wrong. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that was entirely true. And so recently I've, I've having conversations with people, it, they don't have to be so like black and white on that. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. and I know that's a, so I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of comment on the. No, no. I mean, well, uh, but I mean, that's, that's the growth from like 12 through like everything to like now at 40 some odd where it's like okay yeah like this is this is the arc and i we were talking about this in a different kind of context you know previous to this conversation but like that's part of owning your journey just owning the thing that that is you and going yeah this is me and you're going to kick me out of this like you know place because you don't want me touching your stupid guitar (laughs) and whatever sir and you have a good day. <laughs> you have a good day, sir. And good day. <laughs> and it's 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 also part of something we've been talking about on the podcast these last few episodes, your episode, and there's another episode upcoming. And a couple of episodes upcoming. Where we kind of talk about men and how men fit into society and culture. And it takes a long time <clears throat> for particularly modern guys. I would say anybody between the ages of 40 and like 55 it took all of us a long time to figure out what it actually meant to be a man. And some of us still haven't figured it out. That's why like Iron Man Legos still sell. Like they're not selling them to like my five-year-old, although he would buy them. They are cool. Like he would want them, but they're selling them to me because I think they're cool. Yeah. I mean, my brother bought all those transformers for his son. Right. And and it was like, he was, over the moon that they came back in in vogue of course because we're all like 12 year old boys walking around and we have an entire society and culture that's supporting that now <laughs> when it used to be like no drink your beer and chain smoke your cigarettes like your grandfather did drink your beer chain smoke your cigarettes and die of cancer shut up already mm-hmm. yeah. oh, and go to work <laughs> yeah, go to work you know pay, pay, pay the heating bill yeah like be a man like what, what, what's happening um and don't go don't go pick up tampons for your wife at the store like that's not don't do that like that's <laughs> That's not what you do. And now all that's been inverted. Um, 
for good or ill, that's all been inverted. But it's interesting to talk about that inversion because a lot of that doesn't get a lot of. Uh, well, we talked about this previously, but like that gets all wrapped into like toxic masculinity, whatever the heck that means, and just nonsense. And it's just nonsense. It's just it, men have to figure out different ways to be men. Um, that matches the way that we were. Well. I'll, I'll, I'll make a biological assertion from here. Testosterone is a hell of a drug, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have found it, and I've, I've talked with a friend about this. So I, it's just such a weird thing that as, and this isn't necessarily in the black and white, it's, it's, it's my desire to uh, work on like emotional intelligence yeah. and, um, and communicate more effectively and efficiently. And over the, you know, five or six, last five or six years, focusing heavily on those things and, um, and, uh, and, and getting like sort of met with a resistance. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know if you said this with someone else and it's, and it, along the lines of people aren't, they're not really geared up for, for kind of like honesty anymore. Oh, yeah. no. And so it's kind of met with this, this resistance that, you know, I have never felt like more efficient at mm -hmm. that, that, that communicating and so completely throw, like what, like, like, Oh my God, am I, what is happening right now? You right. know? And it's like the, I don't know, kind of, kind of Confederacy of dunces type situation. Oh yes. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> And, and it just always, I come full circle. I'm like, no, I'm the dunce. I'm, I'm <laughs> like, it's, right. yeah, it, it's so. As Jordan Peterson would say, make your own bed. Fix your own backyard first before you go out and repair the world. Like, do, do that. You're going to have enough problem with that. Make make one room in your house beautiful. You're going to have enough <laughs> trouble with that. <laughs> so we kind of, so that, that kind of arcs through the last 20 years. And so now we're here today. Um so yeah, I know you're involved with, um, there's like, uh, you're doing several different things. Like you're writing poetry, you're making music, you're going to open mics, you're you're doing some work with a nonprofit, correct? Um, talk a little that, bit about that. You know, you're doing some of that. Um, you've also got a book that came out a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'd like to hawk or at least talk about on the podcast. Um, and of course, you are looking for work, which is the perpetual kind of thing. Um, but not necessarily looking for work in terms of, hey, I'm broken and employed and I'm really doing this for somebody's house because like I'm going to go into the cardboard box out back. I'm not Elon. I don't have a few billion in my well, in my in my couch cushions. <laughs> or maybe you do. Like billionaires actually do dress like you. Like Jack Dorsey, he's the last guy I saw that actually kind of like all you got to do is, is like braid your beard and then you're like Jack Dorsey. Like you're all the way there. No, I've met a few people at uh open mic and uh one guy is an attorney and he's like uh you know he's like i make like more money than i even and he's got four kids mm -hmm. divorced and um and he's i think he said he has a hundred guitars and they're not like you know the f entry level ibanez right he has like you know five thousand dollar gibsons and and, and I'm just like, you have a hundred guitars? And he's like, yeah, they're just in this thing. And I was like, dude, that's crazy. And so, and I, I said something along the lines. I was like, well, I don't know. It, it, oh, what he commented on was, I said, I feel, I said, uh, he said, what have you been up to? And I said, I'm finally getting back to work. Um, you know, I've been working on uh, this sort of website and working on uh, this other writing projects and, and some music. And I feel more confident and, he said, I love that when you say uh, you're going back to work, it has nothing to do with a job. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, man, I was like, it's, you know, once you kind of like you figure out and we've had this conversation years mm -hmm. ago, it's like once you, you, you know, you, it's it's not that difficult to kind of make enough money to live well. Right. And, and kind of like move on for, you know, use that as the foundation so you can do the other things. Well, it's, it's not that hard, like, <clears throat> it's not that hard if you are not necessarily a Gulliver-like, no, I won't even frame it like that, if you haven't made choices 
um, to create obligations in your life and responsibilities that are going to require you to take on other things, then yeah, it's not that hard. It's, it's really not, you know. Um, but that requires you to put other things on hold. Like, you know, I'm not going to ask you, like, about wife and kids. Like, I'm not going to ask you that question because that's, like, really intimate and personal. And those are decisions that, like, have genuine financial consequences, you know. Um, and that's something that I think, going back to society and culture, societies and cultures, used to, particularly our society and culture, used to be really good at explaining to men. Like, there's an actual financial cost to doing this thing, mm -hmm. right? There's an actual financial cost to being a Johnny Appleseed and spreading your stuff all over the place. And there's a societal cost and there's a cultural cost. And we, by the way, we will hold you accountable for that cost. We just will. And then right around, I would say, probably 68 to like 72, we kind of as a society decided that no-fault divorce and a massive welfare state were the direction that we were going to go in. And, 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 you know, now it's 2022 and here we are. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, so there you go. Uh, it, I'm not putting like, any of that on you. Then none of that's about you. We're, we all grew up in the shadow of all of that, you know, and oh, we're just yeah, uh, living no, in the space. I mean, well, it's interesting that uh, some people, th there's this movie, Man on a Train. Uh, okay. I, I, it's a foreign film. I suggest uh, check it out. But, it, and I'm not going to do the synopsis, but it's like the kind of like the, summation like the grass is always greener or like the yeah. Yeah. and I, I just realized long ago but it's like there's not there's no grass on the other it's just a it's a it's a barren lot it's the same barren lot you're standing in, same barren lot you're standing in. and um and uh i've met people who are it's not uncommon for people to like wow you're free right you're free you can do whatever you want and it's like well so you can too. Right. You know, so this isn't anything. And it's like, I said, yeah, there's a huge, um, exactly what you just said. There's a, I said, there's an enormous cost for right. me choosing to like kind of have this lifestyle. And I, I tried to get out of it, but that backfired. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't too long ago. And, and you know, it was within a year ago. And, and, and uh, you know, I was, you know, I was like, kind of holding out and waiting and waiting and waiting and, and, and you know it's not like i'm foreign to like i said to you the other day it's like you know and this was in regards to the making mm -hmm. enough money to sustain yourself it's like you know and i make a lot of really bad decisions <laughs> so like and I, I don't know and if you look at things from life is just the journey and the you know, continuous mm -hmm. growth and learning this and that and you use what uh, the information acquired along the way for the better benefit of yourself or others and that, then, you know, there's, there's no, there's really no, you know, kind of like fault or mistakes made in that sort of way. And, and, um, and I, you know, I think you hit on it earlier. It's like, there's this, this, uh, you know, you, you're 43, you're going to be 44. Oh well, yeah. No, I'm going to be 43. You're going to be 43. Yeah. Just a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody says that. Depends, so, on, like, depends on where you're standing in what room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I don't, I don't know if it is. I don't know how all these things sort of like intertwine, but whether it's the biological aging, whether it's like uh, life experiences catching up, whether it's like my brain healing from the brain damage, or that sort of thing, or all those things kind of like coalescing at once, and uh, and the, the world being in the state that it's in and kind of like having this rebirth of gratitude for mm -hmm. every single moment and every day uh that it gets a little easier to kind of like process and let go and, uh, of things that are completely out of my control um so yeah you know. well you know in the bible um god called abraham or abram as it was out of his father's house at like 75 so it's never too late to go on the road <laughs> it's just that's that's what i take from that's what i take from genesis <laughs> it's never too late to go on the road. it's never too late to go on the road god 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 ain't done with you until god's done with you so it's, it's funny never too late to go on the road i mean that's uh that kind of works for the band genesis too if you look at uh before phil collins yes you know but uh I read something the other day that like Phil's like I'm not he he, he can't drum anymore. Yeah, I think he's got like arth arthritis and um, or some other 
maybe degenerative thing and also maybe some cognitive stuff that is wow. like a, more of a genetic thing. So, um, yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, we are reaching the age where like now it's not celebrities dying. It's people we know. Yeah, friends. Right. Like I recently saw a obituary for someone who I knew personally, <clears throat> real nice guy. Um, who ran an organization, which I will keep nameless, and will keep the name of it out of my mouth, but, like, knew this guy fairly well, and he helped me get a job when I needed a job, um, and allowed me to treat it in a way where it didn't feel like a job, which was great, and he, like, retired, and then he died, like, two years later, and I'm just like, really? I guess I guess we're there now, and... I don't want to talk about mortality because that's a downer, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, the, yeah, yeah. But you know, you, you know, at a certain point you reach a point where on a long enough timeline, as was stated in fight club, on a long enough timeline, everyone's survival rate drops to zero. And so, you know, you can say that ironically and smile about it when you're like 25 and the year spread out before you, but when you get on the other side of 40, you're like, Oh no, that's, that's, that's truth <laughs> like that's real truth well i think to uh my advantage as far as the perspective goes um to have visited that place <laughs> yeah. on a yeah. couple occasions and right. you know and have to be sort of resuscitated and, and, and uh you know uh punched back into breathing or whatever and uh so that's uh by it, the way it, it, yeah I'm going to ask you the question that uh, Wyatt Earp um, asked Doc Holliday in Tombstone when he, Kurt Russell, asks Val Kilmer in Tombstone when he's playing cards with him and something about there being angels in heaven. No, it wasn't Val Kilmer. It was his little brother. And <clears throat> Kurt Russell goes, it was Kurt Russell's little brother he was asking him about because Kurt Russell's little brother was going to, Virgil was going to go see a medium or whatever um, to hear like the heavenly host or hear angels or whatever, which everybody was going to do in that in the late 1800s. Everybody was going to visit mediums and stuff. Uh, Harry Houdini made a whole career, a post-death career of being contacted and he was never contacted. Anyway, that's a brilliant, brilliant move for a guy like Houdini. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so he, <laughs> so what is it? Is it Kurt Russell asks him? He asks his little brother. His little brother's like, "Oh, we can hear, we hear all the angels of like heavens or whatever." And Wyatt Earp goes, "Well, what do they got in hell? Like, what do they got? Like trumpets? Like, what do they got? Bells? <laughs> they get down there?" And I shouldn't laugh f about it, but like, it was so quick. He he came back with it so quick. But it goes to this idea of, which I did I did want to ask you, but a little bit about this sort of because people want to know. Like when you died, did you see anything? Did you have a near death experience, or or did you or have you ever it thought was, about it in sort of that kind of context at all? I mean, absolutely. Uh, and and it's interesting. Uh, and I don't know if I am going to answer the question truthfully. Great, because, whatever you answer, you want to give is fine. <laughs> because uh, I have, I've, I have to, I have said it to people when asked and much like that resistance thing they tell me that's not what happened and okay. and i find it uh fascinating that someone asked me a question and i answered directly and they said well what do you really think and then <laughs> i and then i have to say something else right yeah and um i i've I made a decision about six months ago to to not I said I am not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this anymore because I can't say it without uh uh well I can't say it without some sort of bias because I did the thing right or the no, thing no, did no, me that's, and uh that's a legitimate answer. And and uh, everything is, uh, every question doesn't have to be answered. And, and, well, here is the thing, though. I mean, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Hmm. You know, uh, and I, I recognize that. And um, 
and as far as the heaven and hell, you know, this is what I said a little bit ago about how I was when I was using and getting high as, as versus to now and like everything back then was all bad and now I need to do good. And it's not necessarily a, what you said a moment ago about uh, visiting in the mm-hmm. hospital and mm-hmm. guilt and shame. So guilt and shame and guilt and shame and the fact that I felt so I went, I mean, there was people who I've known since I was 15 years old Mm -hmm. that I had a difficult time talking to until a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, And it was uh, one of the, uh, one of my friends was uh, cancer and it, like it just a, mm-hmm. about five years of really, really horrible things. And in the middle of that time period, I'm like strung out on heroin and living this, you know, uh, difficult life. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I couldn't get over the fact that I'm watching one of my closest friends on life support in a, mm-hmm. in a hospital room. And I'm living the way I'm doing what I'm doing, and I couldn't even enter the room. So there's like this entire component of, of guilt and shame wrapped into that, and then it it uh it made it really difficult to kind of like reconcile with myself. And I don't know what happened in the more recent years, um, but I had to. Uh, like you know forgive myself for whatever i just started to think of it more in the way of like um and and and, and this is the more recent you know in the last this is not, not being like as willing and accepting as i can be with everyone and everything and uh and doing my best not to to, to get sort of like bent out of shape or mad and kind of that just acceptance yeah. and be a being of love and 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 not you know and judge and 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 you know the the question of like well why can't you do that to yourself how can how can you have that as something that is a focus and a goal in life towards others however when you turn it back on yourself you are not worthy of any of that and it was i i think a moment and that's still we, we talked about this a little bit the other day and that's still mm-hmm. something to and it's not worthy it's just i don't I think I, I know the, um, I know the potential negative consequences of leaning too far. I look at like how the Brooklyn Nets. All right, you got those two guys saying we don't need to be coached. We don't need this. We don't need that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then so it's it's not it, it's it's trying to remain teachable. I think. Yeah. Well, the current state of the NBA is an unteachable moment. Like that entire friggin' league. Like it's it's good lord. Like what 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 you're seeing happen right now is a microcosm for exactly what the rest of society is like. Um and you know, everybody's an expert. Uh everybody is very happy to regale you with their expertise. And nobody's expertise can be questioned or critiqued because it just can't be questioned or critiqued. It's like, <laughs> I mean, we were talking about Kevin Smith, too fat for forty. I mean, it's it's now we're we're arcing all the way back to the beginning of our the beginning of our podcast, the beginning <laughs> of our you know, Call and it, right. And it's it's and if you didn't listen to that, go back and listen to it. But like it's 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 all of that. It's it's I can't be critiqued. I can't be. But you know what? It's it's the logical end. It's the clearing at the end of the path of the whole. My morality is your morality. There is no absolute truth. There's just relative. My truth, your truth. Don't judge me. And then now well, here we are. Like here we are. We have we have million dollar athletes that are uncoachable. Um, or we have million dollar athletes that are like, I'm the greatest of all time. And they sat out the last like two games of a playoffs that they are not a playoffs so like getting a seed <laughs> in the West that they could have actually gotten oh. and then they want to like thump their chest about how they're the greatest in the freaking league in comparison to oh i don't know one of the greatest basketball players in the modern era michael <clears throat> james <clears throat> jordan but you know what i'll just leave that aside lebron <laughs> i think it's jeffrey 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It might be Jeffrey. Michael Jeffrey Jordan. It doesn't matter. Jeffrey <laughs> James. It doesn't matter. All you need to know is he's got six rings and LeBron has how many? That's it. I, I, I mean, it's the, yeah. I mean, his shoes are still dominate the market. His still influence the still, it, it, it's, 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 it, it, what a tremendous in, in, human being in the sense of like that mentality of like, I will not lose. Okay, so Buddy and I were talking about this, and then we can switch to talking about the the, the other stuff you got going on currently, because I do want to get, I do want to have time to kind of explore some mm -hmm. of that with you. I'm going to hit you with this question, a buddy of mine uh, talk. We and I talk, he and I talk about this all the time. So Tom Brady came in, did did Tom Brady did the Tom Brady show for 12 years or whatever, however long he's been doing the 12 the Tom Brady show, goes away for literally three seconds, can't deal with it, <laughs> and is like back to do to finish up the Tom Brady show or to do more of the Tom Brady show. Okay. Is he probably going to wind up in an ignominious end smashed underneath a 19 year old? Probably. But because this is usually what happens in that kind of arc in a physical game like football. That's not the question, though. But it is the, the foundation. It's the baseline for thinking about this idea. Tom Brady is 45 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, he's old enough to remember Michael Jordan the same way you and I are. He didn't have to watch Michael Jordan highlights on YouTube or TikTok. He saw Michael Jordan play. He saw Kobe play. I assert that we are the youngest end of the oldest generation that has actually seen actual excellence. I think subsequent generations are not going to see excellence because in order to be excellent, you have to be willing to be coached, be critiqued, um, be able to sift between, you talked about guilt and shame, be able to sift between what's guilt and shame-based feedback, like Brene Brown would talk about, and mm -hmm. what's genuine feedback designed to make you grow. And you have to be strong enough internally and resilient enough internally to be able to do that. And we're the oldest, we're the youngest end of the oldest generation that actually was okay with not being liked. Like, that's not the driving thing of our, because we didn't care about social media because we all got grafted into that crap. It wasn't the thing that we were actually born into that where our peers confronted us or didn't and all that. Like, I asked somebody this today in a different context. How many times in your life between 12 and 18, you know, with everything you were doing, did you get a, in a fist fight? Like, how many times did you get punched in the mouth? Uh, me? But, right, yeah, you. Oh, I've never been touched. You've never been touched? Okay. I got punched in the mouth a ton of times. A ton. I mean, I, I fucked some shit up. <laughs> I got a few fights, you know. I I, I, th I got a fight in college. The the tight end, or the defensive end, oh, like yeah. knocked on my bedroom or my dorm room door, and yeah. he was like, "Why were you laughing at me, and my girlfriend?" And I was like, "Oh, dude, I wasn't laughing. We were drinking." Yeah, and I, he lived down the hall, or whatever, and and so he's like, "You're coming out in the hallway, and we're fighting." And I was like, "Dude, I don't want to fight. I have a friend in here, man." Right. And, uh, and he's like, and he kept knocking on the door and I was like, all right. And I like, I was, you know, 160 pounds yeah. just living on booze and we went out in the hallway and he's just looking at me and, and, uh, I went out, well, I took my shirt off, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and, yeah. and he was looking at me and I, I like put my left foot behind his foot and I pushed him down and I just got on top of him and just like started punching him in the head. Yeah. And his yeah. girlfriend grabbed this chain that I was like wearing in the nineties, like a skater thing or whatever. Of course. And uh, I wasn't really paying attention or, or someone did that. And it kind of hurt. There was a black and blue mark of the edge chain around my neck. Oh, yeah. And without thinking that there was, and I turned and I punched her in the head. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so now it's, the, now it's the way of the gun opening now we're doing so, that you're, you're yeah, Ryan so, Philippe <laughs> yeah so so that's <laughs> whoa <laughs> that's so, a deep so, cut so that's, that's yeah that's, that's really good uh so yeah and it was you know the couple fights that we're in it was booze related and yeah. it was uh it, and uh and, and so that's uh that's it. So never, but think about uh, that act of physical altercation. Like anybody who's making a TikTok video and shadow banning people that they don't like from parties on Instagram is not getting into a physical fight. I think all of those things pile together. The lack of appropriate confrontation skills, the lack of ability to be physical, the lack of ability to take critique, the lack of ability to be coachable. All this piles together. And thus, and this is the assertion that I make to a buddy of mine, I don't think we're going to see excellence like Tom Brady or Kobe or Michael Jordan 
in the places where we normally would have seen it, which would have been sports or celebrity, I think we're done with that as a, as a culture until we've refined all of those things again. Now, are there people walking around right now in the millennial generation and in the Gen Z generation and whatever they want to call Gen Alpha, whatever the hell they want to call it, um, are the Gen Prime? I don't know. I've heard crappy the Indigo things. children. Oh, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> are there people who are walking around with those kinds of scars? Sure, okay, maybe. But, like, if your biggest emotional scar is that your cell phone got taken away, not that, like, you mouthed it off to somebody and they hauled off and tried to punch you in the mouth and you actually had to physically defend yourself. Well, I mean, okay, you've learned a different kind of thing. And this gets back to the idea of what it means to be a man also. But let's just leave that aside for just a second. I'm not saying the physical confrontation is better than emotional confrontation. What I'm saying is the, the act of resiliency, the growth of that skill set leads to the development of excellence because mm -hmm. you realize that not everything is going to be given to you. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to take it, to paraphrase from Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we have a entire couple of generations that are now focused on things that were given to them because we gave it to them. And by the way, it's our fault, not theirs. We gave it to them. They just live in the world as was. Okay. Are we going to see excellence? Are we going to see excellence at the Tom Brady level? Because here's one of the greatest quotes about Michael Jordan ever. I think it was Dan Marley said this about him. He came not to just kill you, but to cut your heart out. I don't see that from LeBron. I, I like Kevin Durant, and I thought he had that in him, but I don't think so anymore. I mean, Giannis is kind of the, the closest to if you follow, but I mean, he like he's the closest in the sense of like, I will like uh this is not my body right i am it is sacrificed for well you know, well like i mean and he when stayed your in milwaukee right you like know? when your teammates aren't doing well are you gonna subtweet them or are you gonna get in their face like what are we doing here and and, and sports is the rawest place where you see this i'm not again i'm not saying i want to be very clear on this I'm not saying that there's only one route to excellence. I'm saying the route to excellence that we have seen. Are we going to see people walk that route again? Or is that done? And we're going to have to look for excellence in different places. Well, <laughs> I remember that uh, it was either the, it, it was a, a few days after Kobe died. Mm -hmm. We talked on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know why. And this is really surprising to me, but Kobe dying has had a much greater effect on me than I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you just said. It's, it was the last sort of a bastion of, of excellence available or, 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 or in the, in the public eye or in the culture or in, in I'll, I'll narrow so, it down even further in basketball. Like, I think we're done with excellence in basketball. I think it's on, I think it's over. I think we're done. And it helped kind of uh, enter that concept into the, into like my personal equation. Yeah. Okay. And because I have a lot to say on, on the relationship stuff mm -hmm. on, uh, on like kind of the journey or path that I've been on and why everything it, it, like I am over the fact that uh, in the uh, societal norm, when 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 uh, it, it compared up against that, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's fucking taking me forever. But you know what? I don't. It's it's like I, once removing like time from the equation, in the sense of like uh, a succession of things in order to get to it's it's not and and so kind of doing that makes everything else this more fluid thing and uh i think it's why uh i've been i've been bartending for a few years and you, you know it's uh i can work when when we were at regio i mean i felt like we worked well together right yeah, like you were the person who could go out and talk to the talent because I could not 
I didn't have the capacity at that time, and I still really don't. I, I've gotten a little bit better at it because I just had to over the course of the last few years. But you were the one who could go out and talk to the talent in a meaningful way um, and get them to commit to doing crazy things like, I don't know, producing four poems a week instead of their usual half a poem. You could, like, persuade them into production. In That's a way what where, I'm saying. Right, it's, in a way yeah. where I would just be like, just shut up and dance, monkey. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and because I look at the work. So I have a much more, I, I blogged about this taking off of an idea from Isaac Asimov. You have writers and then you have artists, right? Or not all right, writers, I'm sorry. You have typists and then you have artists, right? And very much sometimes over the course of many years, it would be a situation where I was a typist. Just shut up and do the work. It's the Stephen Pressfield idea. Just shut up and do the work. Show up, do the work, type the thing. It's going to suck and it doesn't matter. You need to do the work. You need to build the muscle, right? And if you're spending so much time not building the muscle because you're being precious about a thing, and by the way, I run into this quite a bit in my business with working with graphic designers sometimes or, um, or, um, or instructional designers, um, you know, when you work with those folks, sometimes researchers, sometimes they could be so precious about the thing that they don't actually produce the thing, right? And so being precious about the work doesn't lead to more excellence, it's just hiding. And so you're either going to be Isaac Asimov, who's by the way, who by the way wrote 400 novels, only a handful of which one were good. One of those good. prolific and oh fine on topics that are unbelievable yeah. but but what he did was he decided to get up Stephen Pressfield talks about this in the war of art he got up and he decided to work that's what he did um he decided to type that's what he did whereas you get Donna Tartt who's written like hey buddy who's written like freaking like I think like five books in 20 years and she she's done excellence but it's it's on the long haul hold on a second Charlie Daniels band is in heavy rotation in my house. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, interesting. Uh, he's, he's, he's trading it up and he's switching it up. So, you know, the I, wheels on the bus go round and round us, uh, taking a back seat to it's passe. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to, it's time to up the game. <laughs> and he's already doing, he's already doing one, one handed push ups. Whoa. And I'm like, Wow, well, you continue to lap me. Well, that's fine. <laughs> well, I think it was, uh, I forget who was talking about it. It's like, uh, oh, no, it was Norm MacDonald. Like, yeah, I used to let my kid beat me in basketball when he's young. And then he got to an age where he, uh, where he actually was beating me. And he said, you know, I wish I did, had not done that because, you know, he thought he's been kicking my ass this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I so I I I always make sure to tie or just barely beat. Or at least you're get not, the impression that I'm just barely beating. Yeah, it sounds like you're a little uh, uh you know ubiquitous trophy. Uh, don't are you are you giving him a Are you giving him a unicorn? I like it. Don't get me wrong. Uh we're trying to encourage excellence around here. Don't get me wrong. No, there's plenty there's plenty of spaces for me to lean on him. Oh yeah, there's plenty no, uh, of those. Well, I'm just uh, yeah. I mean, you, you know, messing around and yeah. um, and uh, but if you if you don't do that, there is the potential for quitting. Correct, right? So it's a fine line, yeah, right? It it's, is. it's a and that, again that ties into the excellence, you know, idea. There's a fine line for what you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, LeBron. Uh, yeah, okay, you run three rings. I can't take that away from you. You did win three. They were with super teams, but whatever. You did win three, what is it, three, four rings, whatever it was you won. Um, you are, you know, six, eight, and three something. Okay, cool. With like a with like a 64-inch wingspan. Oh, okay, great, cool. Okay. Complete yeah, freaking okay. nature. Complete freaking nature, yeah. The, like good the thing you were supposed to do was that like that to me that's table stakes again those are those are table stakes um uh going beyond just that is where excellence lies that's where well that's where that's where you get to be heroic like and, and by the way this is not just basketball so like if i'm going to a restaurant i would rather have a 
waiter or waitress that's seeking to be excellent in their role in food service because that's the role they've picked. And so that's the thing they're going to be excellent at. And you're not doing it. And you may be doing it. You may be doing it for whatever your motivations are. I don't need to know those. I'm here as a customer to have a service and have a service-based interaction with you, maybe build a little bit of a tiny relationship and move on. Like that, I, I trust me, I know what my role is. And my role is to like not give you a bunch of nonsense and not make your life miserable, to not get in the way of you doing the thing that is excellent. Okay. Um, or if you're a street sweeper, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote about this, right? Be the most excellent street sweeper so that the angels of heaven, when you die, are waiting for you to show up and sweep the streets of heaven because you they can't do it better than you can. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's a concept that is around anymore. And when you were, when you and I were at Regio, you did an excellent job of getting the creatives to do more in that space and to, 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 to cross over that arc between like, I'm a precious person to being a typist and doing the work. Stephen Pressfield before Stephen Pressfield. Um, but then, <laughs> but then my job, and this is fundamentally how I looked at it, my role was to be the guy, and I kind of did it with, with this jazz festival we just did recently. My job is to do all the unsexy stuff that needs to happen. Like, I'm going to go have a conversation with doctor whoever about, like, why we need money. Because Ryan doesn't want to go have that conversation about why we need money. Like, that, his, he's going to forget it. That's not going to be It may spin. It, yeah, the wheels would potentially fall off that wagon. And <laughs> by the time, on the way back, it... There's a completely different wagon. And yeah. It's, 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 and, and it's like, and, wait we, a minute, and we need that? the wagon that we yeah. started with. We need <laughs> that one. <laughs> what just happened? Like, dude, we're, we're in Pennsylvania now. What, you know, right. And, and you're running a cult? Jesus Christ. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? I don't, I don't understand. Uh, and no, we're not. We're not doing that. Um, so like, but th that's my role, right? And that's what I, that's what I do well even now is like, make sure the wheels stay on the bus. This is all you gotta do. Just make sure the wheels stay on the bus and do the little things that, that nobody's gonna thank you for and nobody's gonna give you claps for to keep the wheels on the bus. And I see so many people unwilling to do the things that are gonna keep the wheels on the bus or maybe I'm looking in the wrong spaces. I'll grant you that. Maybe there is excellence out there that I'm missing. Um, uh, because I'm looking in all these other places and just, maybe I'm looking to not find it. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is excellence everywhere and I'm just ig ignorant to it. It's all over Instagram somewhere. <laughs> well, I, th I think it is okay. I, I was listening to, um, uh, a, a, a female rapper, uh, uh, uh talk about, she did a, a song with Eminem and and the interviewer was like, what was it like working with Eminem? And she was just like, like Eminem just is like, that's it. Like he is, he's the thing. And, and um, it's that sort of like, it, it's, 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 I think we're, you know, confidence, affinity, aptitude, and, and, and drive and commit to excellence. It's like, I mean, are we going to see another David Bowie making music for? 50? We're not going to see another David Bowie. We're not going to yeah. see another Freddie Mercury. Prince, I was watching, you know, I was watching a video the other day with, um, what's his name? Um, um, what's his name from Wham? George. George Michael. George Michael. Right. And my wife and I were sitting there and she's like, it was some video from the eighties. And uh, he was very pretty. He's a very pretty man. And I even said that. That's she's like. I was thinking exactly that. Like, yep. <laughs> that's why. That's why I love you. Uh, <laughs> we're both. We're both there. <laughs> and he was, but there was not a hair out of place of that feathered hair. His eyebrows were perfect. The sculpting on his cheekbones was perfect, because he understood fundamentally that I'm putting on a show here. And the show has to be excellent for me to sell the music, but I've got the voice. So the selling is the thing on top. And I just see, and maybe it's a function of the internet. There's just so much slapdash stuff just thrown out there because you can, because the internet's a free distribution platform. So you can just 
slapdash together this, slapdash together that, throw that thing out there. And if it doesn't work, you can be like, oh, well, it was the Internet. No, it was that you didn't put in the effort. But then if you do put in the effort, you get like three likes and you're like, what the hell? I put in all that effort and nobody cared. Right. Because either it wasn't aligned properly or you didn't talk to the right people in the right place or like people ask me this all the time about publishing books. They're like, well, like, are you going to be a New York Times bestselling author? I'm like, "Uh, uh, uh, probably not. But like, that's not the that's not the point that I'm trying to make with my book. I'm not trying to be a New York Times bestselling author. If it happens, I'm not going to turn it down. But the difference between me throwing out something out there that's slapdash and not well put together that rises to the time New York Times bestseller list and something that only three people buy, my mom, you, and like some other random dude somewhere. Like, okay, but at least I infected I affected three people. I'm going to, and oh, but and you spent $10,000 on that, doing that book. Yeah, well, so like it's only money. Like it'll come back. You know what? And I don't think people, part- people can't, people can't, they can't justify both sides of that equation, and that's where you see the decline in excellence too. Well, by the way, uh, I have I have a, a stack of books that are more like reference books that I just kind of like always go to. Uh, this yeah. literary theory book. I have um, uh, an old uh, poetry textbook that has uh, the, the the fundamentals of Scansion in the back. Uh, I have this M. Scott Peck book called uh, the Ro- oh, no, no no not the Rollers Travel. It's a uh, it's called uh, community and peacemaking. The different. It's called the different drum. Community and oh, peacemaking, okay. uh, and a bunch of others. But your your book is in that pile of things of like, and it's one of those things. Uh, uh, William James, a writer, religious experience. Uh, it's one of those things where you can uh, you uh, I a person mm-hmm. you can, I flip through it, like any one of those things. I'm sure it's kind of like an and a resist taking this uh it's kind of i'm sure like the bible you flip open yeah. and start reading and you go oh, yeah. there's there's a there's there's like a wealth of information no matter where you turn to in this oh yeah and i think uh part of the reason uh as far as like the creative aspect uh for me and just like trying to when i'm in that zone of of, of just like dude just uh, I work a lot of uh, inertia. So mm. when I start moving, it's a bit frenetic and, 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 you know, but art is also patient and mm. art is also frenetic and mm. um, seizing those particular moments. So in that time, it's just like you said a second ago, there could be excellence out there, but there's all these other variables. Maybe I'm not looking, not looking in the right places, X, Y, and Z, whatever. Um, but in, in those moments, where I am flipping, through, like I, I'm st- stuck on a poem or or or, or a short story, and uh, I, I need to like I need to interface with something that's going to sort of like block or uh, take me out of whatever the train of thought was going that is blocking me from continuing on mm-hmm. with whatever the piece is I'm working on. Flipping open to any one of those books and reading a few paragraphs or a few pages, and there is you know kind of like oh, all of the answers exist it's just you know it, yeah it's like you know, you know it's like i don't know what, what people say about uh, uh michelangelo mm-hmm. carving like it's it was yeah. in the marble it was in the marble in the there. entire time yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah all right well let's talk about the books i wanted to give you time to talk about the book so you got a book out there talk about the book show the book and then talk about your other projects um and the fundraiser that you're interested in are not interested in, but that you want our support and help with the uh, so the name of the book and I am uh, it's probably not good that uh, we'll have I links to his book yeah, yeah I don't even I, I you know I let someone uh, I let someone borrow the last copy and and uh, yeah well it doesn't matter it's called exploration after death colon a painting and uh, the the. The goal of the book was to document, uh, in a way, there are how-to books, how to make your bed for dummies, or how to, you know, whatever. And the the thought I couldn't get off of was, you know, in reference to the near-death experiences or the coming back to life experiences, which everyone... um, 
is there's no manual for that. It's like, what do you do when you're just the tail end of sort of electromagnetic impulses hmm. staying alive through uh, grace hmm. uh, and then coming back and being like, oh, and there's this completely, I mean, it has affected me. It affects me to this very day in a way that is very difficult to uh, speak about in in a way that in a way that isn't um, one hundred percent completely ambiguous. It's like with I think that is how poetry took the front seat because it's creating a world. It can create a world. It has access to, and that is why it's called a painting because my goal was to have uh, much like when uh, people listen to music, uh, certain music uh, it can trigger the brain to have visuals. And so my goal for the book was for the reader to see to, almost like one of those flip books, magic flip books or whatever. And you see that uh, that was the goal was was for people to to get so uh, um, uh, creatively uh, inspired in their mind's eye for what the words and the scenery was on the page that they're creating their own sort of uh, world as a response to what I'm saying. Um, so there's that. And then uh, um, the nonprofit is, so my friend, uh, Kyle Corbett, his nephew is uh, a kid by the name of Devin. He's uh, 16 years old. And during a, uh, um, a, a school trip or something like that, he, he was in Colorado, he was skiing down a mountain and there's an accident. He was helicoptered out of there and, and, uh, and he's, yeah, brain damage. And I don't know if he can walk, you know, I, I, like, it's not good. And his family has dumped like millions of dollars into, you know, his care. And so Kyle uh, worked with his family to start this, um, this charity and uh what i'm what my goal is to uh spread it on the platforms that i uh use on a regular basis also i work at a nonprofit, finlay market in cincinnati and uh Sam, samantha is always looking for charities to kind of contribute towards and so working with them, I would like to put on and set up or contribute to or outline or help in any, whatever capacity I can. Uh, maybe have Kyle come up here and play some shows. He is, uh, he is a magician on the guitar. It is crazy. It sounds like I'm being hyperbolic or whatever. It, no, it's, it's freaking ridiculous. And it's just a tremendous artist and, and, and musician and just, uh, you know, fabulous human being and um, see if it can kind of help put together uh, s something that is, that would contribute towards that, that, um, that charity, that fund. We'll have links <clears throat> to all of the, to both of the areas. Um, that uh, Ryan has talked about so passionately uh, today in the show notes below the podcast player of your choice, whether you're listening to this on Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, iTunes, <clears throat> anything through Overcast, TuneIn, or any of those other obscure networks, even if you're listening overseas, which we do have several listeners in European countries, including Russia, and as well as in the Far East, in India and China. And so if you are interested in supporting Ryan um, and supporting the Corbett family, uh, we will have links to that as well as links to Ryan's book to be able to pick that up on Amazon. Thank you. I don't have anything else. Yeah, well, else. I, I, I have, so 
the uh, I guess they, they would just be blogs. Uh, so one blog is the ghost who sells memories dot com, and that is there is uh, uh, that co the, the the Corbett uh, charity is, is linked in there, um, and it's also a bunch of uh, my writing, uh, primarily poetry. There's some uh, maybe essays and short stories in there. I started a few years ago. It was interesting to look back, and it's like you've had 200 posts and it's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I went by. And then, so uh, then there's also uh, the ghost who sells memories dot info. And there is uh, kind of an outline of uh, music. Uh, there's about, you know, 10 tracks on there that have been kind of recorded uh, at different places. Um, and there is, Oh, I do want to talk about how the ghost who sells memories came into existence. So yeah, there is right. there is a Tom Waits song called uh, uh, for, uh, uh, Tom Trobert's Blues. It's the first song off the 1976 album, Small Change. And uh, Tom Trobert's Blues and in parenthetical notation, it is uh, four sheets to the wind in Copenhagen and then uh, or just waltzing Matilda. And so, uh, waltzing, it, it, waltzing Matilda is a, uh, it is a, uh, Australian term, uh, meaning, uh, you're just kind of like homeless and, and wandering and wandering, uh, with no destination. And so that's the waltzing is a Matilda. Matilda is a kind of a fashioned, uh, you take like your sleeping apparatus and then uh, uh, enrolled in that is all of your possessions thrown over your back. And so waltzing Matilda. So there's also a uh, unofficial national anthem of Australia called waltzing Matilda. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the name of the song. And one of the lines in the song is, uh, and the ghosts who sell memories. And uh, I love the image. I think it's, I think it's brilliant. And so to avoid uh, plagiarism, the ghost who sells memories. It's, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, however, maybe I should change it because it would be awesome to have Tom Waits just knock on the door one day and yeah. start grumbling. With uh, yeah, yeah. Cigarette so, ridden <laughs> voice of his. <laughs> and, and, and so um, it, it, it kind of like turned into what you were saying before about open mics is. Uh, after a, a period of just kind of like isolation, COVID and this and that, one day I was said, I'm going to go to, uh, I got to need to get out of the apartment and went to an open mic and, and I read a few things and it was well received, uh, but I didn't like not looking out at the crowd. And so the next time I went, the next like, you know, that's, this is what I do now is I just get on stage and I just start sort of like talk, I talk, you know, kind of like, uh, uh, you know, stories from my sordid past. And uh, it is, it, it has turned into kind of a, a comedy and uh, which is, which is the goal and intent. And I think that's what the goal and intent the entire time uh, after a certain point of the act of addiction was you know, at a certain point, um, you're just alone. It's a very uh, you know, isolating existence. And so I had to uh, figure out ways to entertain myself. And so that came along with that came a lot of interesting decisions. And so, um, and so that's kind of like a branch uh, of, of that sort of creative thing. And um, yeah, so that's, that's all the stuff. And I can't thank uh, Hayson enough for, uh, you know, getting in touch and allowing and having this opportunity to, you know, kind of uh, talk about it some of these things here and um you know oh the last thing i, I do want to say oh and one more thing he like steve jobs would you like to see one more thing and one more thing well it's actually two there's one more thing but there's kind of two more things we'll, kind of two more things okay so <laughs> so the one thing is uh it was listening to the first uh the first uh interview and uh I, you know i talk about uh my brother my sister in a way, as far as like, you know, uh, uh, like a gauge of intelligence. So it has no, 
what it, what what value does something have if it cannot be applied and they have both and i one of the reasons i feel comfortable saying what i said is because we i have had that conversation with them over the years and mm -hmm. it hasn't always been st it started by me mm -hmm. you know it's them being like hey dude you can't you can do this but we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not a and so uh and so i mean they're the, i cannot do what they have done it, mm -hmm. i look at that it, it is a uh it is a, a puzzle if i had all the pieces i would just i would make a different i would be jamming it, it just and it, it would just be wouldn't mess. work it would not work at all and so like they're the two of my favorite people and mm -hmm. uh what they've been able to accomplish and are still accomplishing is is commendable and um and i tell them that all the time so uh so there's that and, yeah, yeah. and so the the last thing is uh i i do have a, a kind of a short, a short story that i was uh going to read oh okay yeah go ahead so this is called uh and at some point in here uh well fuck it when i say i <clears throat> When I say I'm blue, I'm blue, I mean I'm hypoxic. I come to in a day mare's dream. I turn to my nine o'clock, level of certainty, toes on edge, fingertip blood, razor blade eyes. I sway on a cliff of epistemic doubt and philosophical skepticism. This did happen. The two-lane highway rumbles below America's transcontinental commerce and touts rubber, metal, and steel, capitalism's perpetual erection in tow, bracelet widgets, my pet limp ball, trading cards, plastic, cups, toys, tables, cables, hoses, horses, chairs, pens, linoleum flooring, every flavor of sugar-free soda, Rusty oil drums packed with human lard, palette upon palette of Kardashian logoed pink Uggs stained with the blood of yellow fingertips and obsidian flesh. And as America's black diesel breath puffs by, Polly is asleep in the passenger seat. And every 10 miles or so, she attempts to gesture in my direction. But her but her dream state heavy-eyed uh, puppy diagnosis adheres to the intransigent will of her nascence, as if fully compressed by exhaustion's weight. And, well, fuck the naysaying epistemics of my previous paragraph's philosophical skepticism. I need to get off the road. Stat. As we carve a path through the hummus-colored scenery, it undulates with cinematic aspirations and delight, while the white jello mold clouds overhead throb and swell like the bulges of 10-year abstinent troops of Cosby and hyenas frothing at the mouth. Their rapacious gaze focused on the house party's couch-passed-out pony. Methed out truckers pop saccharine pillows of horse hoof sweets between hourly self-gratification sessions and Maury Povich episodes. The black hole pupil of my cyclopic eye smashed against the windshield like a seasoned chef's nicotine stained fingers, pressing ground baby meat into manageable sized patties. We speed along an X and Y axis of some wannabe surreal desert dystopia, the sun a molten globe on a gaffer's blowpipe. My eyes adjust like an eclipse staring child. Car tiles grip the sweltering road like dime store magic tricks or blowflies caught on a yellow ribbon of doom. The road requires my full attention. I squint through the insect decimated windshield. The road escapes via thermodynamics illusory Newtonian defiance. The gray road evaporates in the direction of middle America's house of God. And like an irrationally confident frog leaping across a six lane highway, 
this mechanical beast weaves through kaleidoscopic, the kaleidoscopic aridness. I am equal parts panic and safety seeking when I pull off the road. Our chariot lumbers next to a gas pump, lumbers in next to a gas pump. This establishment is an obvious front for a local governmental official, a local governmental officials uh, pedophilistic sex trafficking operation. At the second pump, I park and I leave the car running. As I exit the vehicle, I look to confirm the pump number. I use a spare key to lock the door and head into the smart part of the gas smart. My mental fog weighted blue to burnt orange wrapped in damp gray silk vacillations. My mental fog has a bad knee and his wife just left him and she took everything of value with her, even the Billy Holiday coffee table coasters, savage. I devise a plan to our next destination unknown. Two things are certain. I need cocaine and I need a drink. And outside of minor logistical interferences, this should prevent, this should present no significant problems. Gas Mart Corner, the hot pocket video poker market of anywhere in Nevada, desert, USA. Grafting, grading fluorescent lights reflect the pervert. The perverted neglect apparent on each cigarette stained countertop and rust flaked shelf. My survey, I, my survey finds Kiwi Lime Mad Dog and No Frills 20 ounce paper cups with the 90s purple and blue markings, uh, detesting all viable chances of classic aesthetic markings. Through straws from paper cups. However, I gather sundries. I use the restroom to empty my bladder and collect my thoughts. A man is walking out as I enter. I splash my face with cold water and give myself a barely audible pep talk. A series of two grunts with a questioning inflection. I dry my face as I walk into the stall, which is relatively clean. An exhale leaves me, I'm relaxed. I fish a gram of cocaine from the makeshift pocket. I cut into the zipper flap of my green cargo shorts. God is good. It is fluffy and dry. I twist off her wings and empty a dime sized serving into my left hand's biological snuff box. My right hand deftly retwists the baggie and returns the package from whence it came. I press my right thumb to my right nostril and form an airtight seal. A fierce inhale through my left nostril follows. My eyes glaze, my body goosebumps. And I exit the stall and restroom. The smart is now empty, except for a lone employee behind the counter. He appears, his appearance and demeanor are an amalgam of every convenience smart clerk ever. The clerk is languorous and gobsmacked by the corpuscular brilliance of the setting sun. He looks poetic and peaceful. And a part of me hopes his trance is broken before I arrive to the counter. I am envious of his peaceful gaze. It is tranquil and beautiful. It seems to stop time. Like an orchestra of melodious crickets, lulling a full plate moon to sleep. Stuff my cargo pockets with the following items. Two bags of Jack Link's beef jerky. Two 12-ounce paper cups two lids and straws, and two bananas. Lastly, I grab two bottles of Kiwi Lime Mad Dog and carry them, carry them to the checkout counter. As I empty my pockets on the counter, I say, that's the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. Without breaking his stare, he says, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's why I keep this job. I say, a better reason than most. If that is not proof of a higher power type entity, I'm not sure what is. Amen, he says. I say, I'll take these items, a pack of camels, and $30 on pump two. By the way, I didn't want to interrupt the sunset. Do you mind if I grab these cups, lids, and straws? Uh, if you have to charge me, I understand. Uh, I hand him cash while he answers. He says, ah, they're on the house. From one sunset admirer to another. 
Thank you, kind sir. Appreciate that, I say. I see Brown bags the order. I say, oh, one last thing. About how many miles outside of Vegas are we? <laughs> Quasi inaudible, automatic response, a hair north of 26 miles. So that's that. That is indeed that. Thank you, Ryan Stout. Thank you kindly, sir. I'll be uh, talking to you soon. And thank you, uh, whoever is listening to this. <laughs> Much love, brother. Wow, you like that video, huh? That was a pretty good interview, wasn't it? If you'd like to see more of this, please subscribe to the Hassan Sorrell's Audio Experience video channel here on the Hassan Sorrell's Presents video channel here on YouTube. Just um, hit the button somewhere in this thing here. Hit that button and subscribe. You'll get more videos, and when I upload more videos, you'll get the notices. I also wrote a book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership. Go check that out on Amazon and Barnes & Noble today. And uh, thank you for your support with everything that's happening inside of this box right here. <laughs>